Now we're looking at a displacement versus time graph. Okay. I, I wrestled with this in a little bit, guys, because to answer this question really clean, calculus would really help. But calculus is not a prerequisite. So I'm going to do the following. If I have a constant velocity, what do I expect the um, displacement graph would look like? So let me write this. If I say x equals to dt, I'm basically saying this, but I have no acceleration. All right. What is this? What would a graph of this look like? A straight line, but not necessarily horizontal, right? So, like you say, it's a straight line. It would be like this would be one. All right. If there's no acceleration, does everybody see that? Okay. That this graph implies that if you have a constant velocity, then you would expect to have a straight line displacement graph. But I don't have a constant velocity, do I? So what did I just rule out? A can't happen because I can't have a straight line. All right. So um, even worse, what does B tell you is happening? I'm parked. Right. The position never changes, and that's not what I've got going. I'm not parked, so that can't happen. So now it's between C and D. So the question we have to ask ourselves is, we wait a long time, does this location get negative or does it get positive? Negative because the negative force is larger. So no matter how it starts, at some time, if I wait long enough, it will eventually have to go negative. And that tells us the answer has to be D. Does that make sense? Not just because I said it and it's Friday and you want to go home. Yes. So when I look at this, the force to the left is bigger. So what that means is if it's moving to the right, this is still possible, but it will stop and turn around and eventually go left. Right? And if I wait long enough, it'll go so far left, it'll, I mean, it'll be left of where I started, which makes it negative. So it has to be D because D is the only thing that goes negative. So Don't nod if that didn't make no, sense. No, yeah. So, so since it's going negative, we have to look for, for uh, the line that's already been negative. It, it, I mean, it's perfectly possible that it started positive mm -hmm. and it moved to the right for a little while, but then the forces stopped and swung it around the other way eventually. Okay. Yes? So even though that can't tell you what direction it's going at first, you should know that if it's more negative, then accidentally it'll go negative. Yes, exactly. So which way is the force of gravity? So if I throw my keys outward and I wait long enough, where are they going to go? Yeah. Down. So if they can go up at first, but they can't keep going up. They're going to have to turn around and go down eventually. Yeah? I'm sorry, can you tell me why it's not A? Why it's not A, yes. Because A, and this is the best one I said is a little tricky. If you have a location graph that's a straight line, it tells you that the velocity is constant. All right? Because what happens is, if you had an acceleration, velocity would keep changing. And because velocity is defined to be the change in x over the change in t, right? That's the definition of velocity. And so that tells you that if the velocity never changes, then this is just a straight line. OK? In other words, the slope of the line is the velocity. And therefore, since it's a straight line, it has a constant slope, and I can't be accelerating to have a constant slope. But like for example, like the like it's like a parabola. So I that there was in the case that it, was, that it stopped at some point, right? And it, it, yeah, it, yeah, if you have a turn point, you're right. It would indicate that it was stopped here or that it was stopped here, right? It would stop and turn around and go the other way. But in this one, it goes off positive, and that doesn't match my picture. This would this would be a possible picture for an unbalanced force, but I need a bigger positive force than a negative force. This one I have a bigger negative force, so I have to choose. And then A, it never stops, so... Yeah, A, it never stops at all. So and, and, but it's also because the velocity never changes, so there's no force, there's no net force. And I, from my picture, I can see I have to have a net force because F2 is bigger than F1. Yeah. yeah? yeah. Yes? So if we took away F1, uh, we could A. If we take away F1, we still have D. If we take away F2, we have C. Let's think about that. If I take away F1, I still have a net negative force, don't I? 
So it's going to accelerate to the left. So eventually it's got to be very negative. If I take away F2, all I have is a positive force, so eventually it has to be very positive. I still have a force, so I'm going to accelerate, so I can't have straight lines. But I, if I had F2 away, then I'd have the C. Yeah. Don't take both from away, then you have B, right? Not necessarily. Um, if I take both of them away, I have either B or A. I have B if it was sitting still, I have A if it's moving at a constant velocity. Does that make sense? Yeah. So if I have no force at all, I can still move. I just can't have any curves. Yes. It just has to be a straight line. Unless there's friction. You see some? Unless there's friction. Which would be a force. Okay. All right. Friction. Good call. Yes. Friction would mess it up. It would give me an additional force. Okay. Your brain's hurt yet? Yes. Good. Because I'm doing the, I'm doing it right. Um, all right, so then um, I've got this question. I'm going to pose a situation, and then we're going to try to figure out which of the possible answers to explain the situation. If a car is moving to the left with constant velocity, I stop right there. A car is moving to the left with constant velocity. What can you tell me about the stuff we've studied? Going negative. It's moving to the left with a constant velocity. It has a negative velocity. What else can you tell me? It's not accelerating. What would cause it not to accelerate? No gas. No what? No gas. Oh, you're getting way too practical. Um, um, actually, running out of gas would cause you to negatively accelerate until you coast it to a stop. But um, but no, what I what I mean is, if I know that I'm moving to the left at a constant velocity, is it possible for a force to be acting on it? There's no net force. There's no net force. So I can have either no force at all or whatever forces I have, have to add to zero. All right. So you can have forces, but they have to add to zero, or there's no force at all in the direction of motion. So either of those will work. Here's the choices. There must be no forces applied to the car. Yep. That's a possible, but it's not general. You understand what I'm saying? That's a special condition. Let's keep going. The net force applied to the car is directed to the left. No, because they said it was going at a constant velocity, so if there was a net force to the left, what would be happening? It would be accelerating to the left. The net force applied to the car is zero. Bingo. The most general answer. The net force equaling zero could be no force at all, or just summing to zero. So even though A was right for a special case, C, the one I just said, works always. A says the net, there must be no forces acting on the car at all. But then the zero one makes more sense, right? The, the net force equals zero because I can allow forces to be there as long as they add to zero. Okay. And, they, that's right. and in real life, it's constant. really pretty much impossible to have situations with no forces at all. And that is what allows it to keep going constant, right? Yep. If the net force is zero, it'll be constant because there's no acceleration. All right. And then there's but the last one says there's exactly one force applied to the car. Uh, no. All right. Now, an object cannot remain at rest unless. An object cannot remain at rest unless. So before you even look at what I really encourage you with multiple choice, which by the way I never give you on tests, but I don't fill in the blank multiple choice. I hate questions like that because the answer I want is never there. So um, having said that, let's first answer under what conditions this is possible. An object cannot remain at rest unless. You hear what he said? Yes. Do you agree with him? Yeah, I'm here. So it, here's an interesting thing. If the net force is zero, it isn't necessarily at rest. But if it is at rest, the net force is necessarily zero. Does that make sense? All right. So an object cannot remain at rest unless there are no forces acting on it at all. By the way, if there are no forces acting on something at all, is it at rest? Not necessarily. It could be moved would be accelerated. An object cannot remain at rest unless the net force acting on it is zero. And that's where we want to go. The next one is the net force acting on it is constant. What would that cause? If the net force is a constant, I'm definitely going to accelerate. Yeah. All right? Um, well, I mean, that's a possibility. I, I, it could be a constant zero, in which case it's a special subset of the other one, but it's, it, 
it has the conditions that don't work. And again, it says that it can't be at rest unless there's only one force acting on it. And that also is possible. Then the last one. An object will have a constant acceleration if, so we're going to have a constant acceleration if there are no forces acting on it. No. The net force is zero. No. The net force acting on it is constant in magnitude and direction. All right. If it's constant in magnitude and direction, then there's a possibility of having a constant acceleration. Now, the reason they word it that way, where they say, oh, they actually, I didn't read it. They say you have to select the most general response. An object will have a constant acceleration if there is only one force acting on it. True or false? Can you repeat that again? An object will have a constant acceleration if there is only one force acting on it. Absolutely true. Just too specific. If I only have one force acting on it, then that force never changes, so I'm going to have a, a net acceleration that will be constant. But the one that's more general is the net force acting on it is constant in magnitude and direction. So I can have two or 2,000 forces acting on it, and as long as the sum is the same, then it's going to have a constant acceleration. And that's because the magnitude is going the same way, and then uh, it's never changing the direction, so it's correct. Right? So guys, look, I drop my keys. While they're in the air, what's the net force acting on my keys? Give it a name. Starts with a W. Are you with me? The only force I have to out of my hand is the weight. And do they have a constant acceleration on the way down? Yeah. So that's what I say. If there's only one force acting on it, we do expect a constant acceleration. But it's too restricted because I can have three, four, seven thousand forces. And as long as they add up to one constant force, it'll still have a constant acceleration. But doesn't that acceleration, isn't it greater when it's about to reach the bottom? Or is it just constant throughout? You know, the answer is yes. When you ask me, no, no, I ask you. What you're making is a really good observation that we've been skipping. The closer the keys get to the center of the Earth, acceleration actually does increase. But the Earth has a diameter of 6,400 kilometers. They're about 12,000 miles. And I'm talking about a meter. So we really almost can't measure the difference between the top and bottom of the fall. But strictly speaking, you're right. Acceleration actually does increase as we get closer. But almost immeasurable. So we, we completely ignore it. It's still a good, good observation. It's, strictly speaking, it's true. All right. So, um, those are the main ones. When I looked at your homework, that I oh actually it's fine. I, I looked at your homework and uh, I want to go. There's a question. I hate to admit this, so I'm going to try to think. No, I can't think of a story to cover myself. I assigned you a homework question that had a part that we have not talked about, and uh, I'm just going to give you the answer. Uh, I mean, I've had to do it because I didn't see it when I assigned the problem. I apologize. I glanced at the first part and said, yeah, that's a good question. And it's not that it's a bad question. It's just I, to be honest, I couldn't find it in the book. Did the book talk about how to handle percent uncertainty when you're multiplying and dividing numbers? All right, so I will tell you how to do this, guys. And I, I promise you, it's never going to be a test question. It's just like, I want you to be able to do your homework. What happens, um, they ask me if I have a 110 Newton force. But they have an astronaut out in space, all right? And the astronaut pushes with 110 Newtons on, on a beam that has a mass of, oh, no, I don't know the mass. It ends up with an acceleration of 0 0.1, 0 0.12 meters per second squared. And they say, the astronaut's pushing with the force, what's the force? So how would I go about finding that force? Well, what we're going to learn today, and so this is a little bit ahead of where we were, based on the stuff I gave you last time, I'm now going to give you the formal equation that the force on the system, and this little thing I'll talk about. That means the sum. The sum of all the forces that act on the system, no matter how many there are, 2, 2,000, 2 million, doesn't matter. Sum them all up. The sum of all the forces acting on the system will equal the mass times the acceleration. So the mass of the system times the acceleration of the system. All right. Generally, this is easy because we only have one or two forces. So in this case, the astronaut only has one force. So how would I go about finding what the mass of the system is. Do I have the net force on the system? 
Yes, it's the 110 newton force. It's the only one that's there. I have the acceleration. So do you see how I'm going to find mass? All right. So the mass is just going to equal. Um, I'm going to I'm going to cheat a little. We'll do this. All right. So the net force over a, where net just means add up, add them all up. All right. So I'm, I'm going to be able to get this number. <coughs> then they tell me. Oh, by the way. This is the last significant digit here, and this is the last significant digit here. So, what that tells me, what's the uncertainty of my, of my force? How much is plus or minus what? We did this before, guys. It's, it's, the one is what's significant. So, what are the two possible, I mean, the other, what's the lowest possible and the highest possible force that I can be off by? From 100 to 120. Right? Because since it's here, if it were here, it'd be 111 or 109, but it's here. So this is the one I bump up and down by one. So it's either going to be 120 or 100, right? And so similarly here, it's either going to be 0.11 or 0.13. How do you get percent uncertainty is as follows. Delta F over F times 100. Now, to be honest, they did it wrong online for me because they didn't multiply by 100. You're going to need to multiply by 100 to get the right answer. So I would say, what's my delta F? It's 10 newtons, right? That's the my 10 is what I can be off by. I add or subtract 10. That's my uncertainty. And I divide by the number I end up with times 100. And this is going to give me, this is going to give me the percent uncertainty and the force. This comes pretty much like from what we did in lapto, all right? So I'm not telling you, it's not hard. I'm just telling you what to do. Then, for the acceleration, my uncertainty is what? What's the, what's the number I add or subtract? 0 0.01, right? So I have 0 0.01 meters per second squared over 0.12 meters per second squared times 100. And that gives me the percent error for the, for the um, acceleration. What problem is this? I don't remember the number. You'll trust me. You'll see it when you get there. Um, I, so here's the thing I'm trying to tell you. You're going to get a number for this, and you're going to get a number for this. It's easy to get now that I've shown you how. Right? This is very easy to do. And to get the answer, because we needed to divide them to get my answer, the uncertainty in the mass is the sum of these two numbers. That comes from calculus, and I'm not going to prove it to you. All right? I'm just giving you. So I think if I remember right on my problem, I got this was 9% and I got this was 8.3% and they wanted two significant digits, so I added it. I got 17.3, I threw the three away for my two and I got 17% and that was the right answer for me. I don't know if it will be for you. But all I'm telling you, how you get it is by this. Do this problem as soon as you find it and then let it cleanse your mind and float right out. I just want you to be able to get the full points. I'm not going to test problems. Okay. Um, all right. So, unless there's questions, I'm going to move on. All right. Uh, actually, uh, all right. So we're getting ready, little by little, to move into actually solving things that look like physics problems. And in order to do do this, what we need to do is we need to get really, really skillful at what we call free body diagrams. Because the controlling equation that we'll be using a lot is this one. That the sum of all the forces acting on the system is equal to ma. I want you to watch, I'm going to change this equation with two little adding, I'm going to add on two little marks, and I want to be sure you understand what those marks mean. Do you know what it means when I draw a little line with kind of a hook on it like that? It's how we show that it's a vector. Right? So we need, we need to add them as vectors. The problem is that vectors don't add the same way as other things do. And we're not quite ready to worry about this because we're still in one dimension. So I'll just warn you later, I'm going to make this more complicated. But for right now, everything's in a straight line. So it's either positive or negative, and that works fine. But just to show you what I mean, if I take my book and I push it due north and then I push it due west, this vector plus this vector added up to that vector. 
And so we need a mechanism for doing that, and we'll have to wait for a little while before we do. So for right now, we're going to just stick with the idea that everything's in one line. Okay. And um, so the other thing that works is that if I have a situation in which I'm pushing the book like this way, I have a force this way, it still has a weight this way, right? So I could have a situation where here's my book, and I'm pushing on it with a force, but it still has a weight, all right? And what's cool about this is that no matter how hard I push, it never changes the weight. And no matter what the weight is, it doesn't change how hard I push. So these are what we call independent. Therefore, in problems that I do, I can always just treat one dimension at a time. I can just do the x's, or I can just do the y's. And for right now, we'll only have those. But I want us to get used to drawing the pictures. So get out the little sheet that I handed to you. And what we're going to do is we're going to learn how to do free body diagrams. Put a free body diagram and simply a picture of the object that's interesting, and then you draw all the forces that act on it. So, at my first picture, stationary rock. It sounds like a new kind of band, doesn't it? Um, so, what my question is, what are the forces acting on that rock? All right, we have weight, and although it's weight, we're going to write it as mg, right? So, mg is what weight equals. It's the mass times the acceleration due to gravity. We've got the weight. What else? Is, do I have to have another force or is this good enough? I have to have a normal force. Why do I know I have to have a normal force? So, um, because otherwise it would be falling. So I need to hold it stationary. What can you tell me about the size of the normal force compared to the weight? They have to be the same. All right? They have to add it to zero. Everybody good with that? All right. Now, the second picture on the top. The rock is being pulled at a constant speed to the right. This is tricky. Help me draw the picture. As you see a fourth name it for me. Still got weight, right? Still got normal force. There's something to the right, and it's a string. Do you know what we call forces that are due to a string? Tension. Tension. All right? So we've got a tension to the right. But I told you it's moving at a constant speed, so what else has to be there somehow? There has to be something to the left equal to the tension, doesn't there? And it would be friction. Does everybody understand this picture? Do you understand that the weight and the normal force are still going to be there because the table's still there, the rock's still there, although they've got to cancel? Mm -hmm. In order to get this to move to the right at a constant speed, I've got to pull it. There's just no way around it. But if, it, if I pull it and it goes at a constant speed instead of accelerating, it means something's got to go to the left of an equal value so that I don't speed up. The only candidate for that is friction. Mm -hmm. So friction is always going to balance out. Uh, we're not ready to say that yet. It balances out in this picture. Friction doesn't always balance out because watch this. I stopped my book. Friction. Friction stopped. Weight's down. It doesn't go down. My book stopped. So friction wasn't balanced. It was an imbalance in that. So if it's moving across the speed, it's balanced, but it doesn't have to be balanced. Okay? All right. So what I want you guys to do is you can chat with each other. I'm gonna, I would like you to look at the next two pictures, all right, and draw, draw forces on them, and do like I did. Have the forces start in the middle of the rock, because even though it's a rock, it's a point particle, and draw the forces that you think are going on. And not only are you welcome, I encourage you to talk to people around you after you know to just bounce ideas if you're not sure what you're doing. Weight. Mass times gravity. So it's weight.
floor? It's dragging along the floor. Yeah, that's why I put the floor in there. Yes, because otherwise I couldn't get the rope at that angle, could I? That picture's right, you must remember from 110. No, that's a good picture. I don't know. I don't know. It's not some matchup. It's okay. How do you get the piano? The piano actually accelerated. This is not accelerated. Or at least the one, you're the one I think. Oh, it's, it's the thing yeah, it's not worked on. Yeah, it's it's on. I didn't know, I, I didn't know how to show you the I'm trying to do like little cartoony things. I never thought of that as Wi-Fi. Yeah, so now I see it. Hey, can we just do it on here? Can we just do that on here? Do it. So the weight of the Oh, this is yours forever. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. that's your paper to study from. Put your stuff on there so you can look at it later. We're just doing the next two, right? The next two. How's that? We were just doing the next two, right? Just, yeah, for now. So, somebody just want to put their necks on the line. How did you do the, how did you do the first one that I have? Uh, the rock being pulled across the beat of the string. Oh, it's We have a weight, MG. We have a normal force, and <laughs> you have tension. I have tension, and remember, tension has to follow strain. So it has to be here. And, oh. and then the other one is friction. All right, and there's a friction, which is going to be this way, right? Now, no. I'm not. Why is it going to be that way? It's gonna because diagonal. it's going to resist the pull, isn't it? But wouldn't it be diagonal? Friction. Oh yes. Good point. All right. My fault. Whenever two surfaces contact, they are forced on each other. By convention, we break them into two pieces. The part that's perpendicular to the surface is the normal force, and the part that's parallel to the uh, surface is the friction. So friction is always parallel to the surface of contact. Friction can never be an angle. Friction is always parallel to the surface of contact. Now, is my picture properly drawn? No. How do you know? I, well, okay, I, that's, a, that's a good answer, and I hate it. All right, so we've got friction. All right, but what I'm looking at is, are my arrows the right length, and how do you know? They seem equal. Because I say it's going at a constant speed. What do those arrows all have to add up to? Zero. Zero. And the problem, if you look at it, is I've got too much going up and not enough going down to cancel everything. All right? Which, I, mean, I can't change the weight. Which of the things is the one I'm going to have to change? Friction. Friction's in the wrong direction. I need something vertical. The normal force is my only choice. So what happens is the normal force is smaller than I thought. It's actually probably even a little smaller than that. Because what happens is that the, the, the tension is pulling up as well as to the right. And the amount that it pulls up plus the normal force has to add up to this to cancel it. We'll get, don't worry about this too much right now, but can you at least get the idea of the fact? Think of this. If you've got a heavy filing cabinet and you need to move it, what's your instinct to do? It to lift up on it, right? Why do you do that? Because you're right, that lessens the friction, all right? But so, in other words, I, it, because it unloads the normal force. So what happens is if you don't lift up on it, it's not pushing the floor as hard. It's yeah. The normal force and the tension have better plan than weight. Not the full tension. The tension has two parts, one that goes to the right and one that goes up. You see that? And the part that goes up and this has to the weight. The part that goes to the right has to add up to the friction force. We'll get more into that later. All right. So I just want, we'll, we'll visit this again, but I want you to take a look at one of, uh, there's another thing I want you to look at. On the third line, the one on the right, I've thrown the rock up, and I'm looking at the top of the trajectory. 
What is the Wait, no, did you do the one where it was sliding? I didn't do that yet. I'll get back to it in a second. Because I, I, I'm looking at the clock. We'll do all of these later. We're not going to finish them today. Okay. So okay. hang on to this. We're going to do them again. But I, 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 so the rock is thrown. I'm at the top of the trajectory. What, a, what is the free body diagram? Wait. Wait. End of story. Everybody with that? Okay. Nothing else there. Oh, no. Because when it's in the air, nothing. Anyway, forces have to come from somewhere, and the only force is gravity. Oh. Right? Um, so we'll, we'll do more with that later. I, I, and so hang on to it on Monday, or possibly. But play, what I'd like you to do is play around with them. Try to draw in the ones. And, you know, just, you know, I'm not going to look at them, so just make a fool of yourself. Try stuff. Uh, but I have a few of the, no, I'm not letting you go. I have a few of the things I need to talk about. And that's why I'm shutting that one down, because I, 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 need to, I need to talk about a few things before you go. All right. So what we're trying to get used to then get, and getting ready to do is we want to set up a situation which we can analyze motion and, and um, things by, by do, uh, doing free body diagrams and loss. So we're going to stick to things whereby uh, pictures are a little easier. So I have an elevator, I have somebody standing in an elevator, and they're standing on they're standing on a pair of vacuum scales. Alright? Which normally would read their what? Wait. Alright? But the elevator is going to be accelerating upward. Alright? So this is a tension force. This is the weight of everything. Alright, uh, of everything in, in the elevator. Now Here's the thing that I want you to think with me. If I'm interested in my weight, as, a, as not what my weight actually is, but what scales read, what's the object? In other words, when we do free body diagrams, we have to pick something, and then we have to say, draw all the forces on that thing. What object out of all of that do I draw to find out what the scales read? Do you understand the question? No. How many objects are in that picture? Three. There's the elevator, there's me, and then the scales. Which of those three things is going to be the one I look at to find out what the scales actually read? It's as easy as, just think for a minute. I want to see what the scales read, so I must be looking at the scale. Alright, it's that simple. So I draw the scales and talk to me what kind of forces, what kind of forces act on the scales. Alright, my weight acts on them, I don't believe you for a second. And here's why I don't believe you. Weight is a force, and all forces require two objects. Name the two objects. Objects. Things. Things I can take photographs of. Me and the Earth. Right? We've been through this. All right, no. So, guys, this is really tricky for people at first. My weight is just between me and the Earth. If I jump out a window on the way down, does my weight disappear? No. No. And yet, if I were standing on scales, do you know what they would read? Zero. Zero. Because they'd be falling the same rate I am. So, no, my weight has nothing to do with what the scales see. What is the only way the scales know that I'm there? Pressure. And where does that come from? Gravity. Weight. Mm, the, the weight. I'm looking for a name of things that we've been doing. In other words, I'm standing on the scales. Okay. Normal force. Right? In other words, the normal force of how hard am I pushing on the scales? It, when I'm stationary, it is my weight. If I'm not stationary, it's not my weight. All right? So what we have is...